Amen. Thank you, Sister Denise, for blessing us with such a prayerful song, Give Me Jesus. And that is our prayer as well. Let us now come before the Word of God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we'd rather have Jesus than anything else in the world. We yearn for Jesus. We yearn for his kingdom. So give us Jesus. Fill us with the spirit of Christ that we may hear your voice and sanctify us by the word of Christ. And use your servant as a pencil in your hand for your glory, yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we say often, we are living through turbulent times. Not only from the pandemic, but also from the political turmoil and instability. No doubt that you have heard many comments about what happened at the U.S. Capitol. It is discouraging to see our nation going down the path of disgrace. So I want to encourage you with a brief word from our Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord Jesus was arrested and brought before Pilate, the Roman governor, he said in, in the Gospel of John 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. We as servants of Jesus Christ belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. And that's why we don't fight as the world does. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. We participate in the affairs of the world to fulfill God's calling as witnesses to Christ, but we don't belong to the world. We belong to a kingdom that is infinitely greater, infinitely more glorious, and a kingdom that is indestructible. The Apostle Paul, as an earthly citizen of the Roman Empire, said, our citizenship is in heaven. So we as earthly citizens of America participate in the political process, work together with people from different backgrounds, and represent Christ our King. But we belong to a kingdom that is radically different in nature. One of the great temptations right now is to confuse the kingdom of this world with the kingdom of God. If we confuse this, then we become impatient. And we think we can usher in the kingdom of God. If we have the right politicians, the right party, or the right policies. That's a great temptation. No human being can usher in the kingdom of God. Only God can bring his kingdom into our nation. Our only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. In such turbulent times as these, we must stand on Christ, the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. Setting our hopes on any politician or any political party is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So don't try to stand on any other ground. 
Stand on Christ, the solid rock, and Him alone. And your greatest weapon is the kingdom prayer. The problems are far bigger than, than any humans can handle, and only God can set things straight. So pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come into our hearts first. Thy kingdom come into our church. Thy kingdom come into our nation. And thy will be done in our nation as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us now continue with the topic that we started last Sunday. What it means to be truly human. The question of our origin is one of the most important questions of our time. Where did we come from? How did we get here? Who are we? Are we evolved from animals? Are we just products of random mutation and natural selection? Does Darwinian evolution explain who we are? For some of us, we don't struggle with such questions. What the Bible says is sufficient for us, and that's okay. But for some of us, it's important that we answer the questions arising from the secular environment that we live in. On the internet, you can listen to lectures on the Old Testament taught by pro prominent professors in secular universities. And they will assert in no uncertain terms that the Genesis account is a mythology invented by ancient people and that science has replaced mythologies as the only explanation for the origin of humans. Such an assertion needs to be answered. If you give in to the pressure of secular philosophy that the book of Genesis is a mythology and you are merely a product of randomness, then it's going to change how you understand who you are and how you live. If you are only a product of randomness, then you might as well follow your feelings and change who you are so that you can feel better about yourself and be true to how you feel. Such a philosophy is a consequence of the belief that you are a product of randomness. That's why the question of our origin is of utmost importance. Last Sunday, we began with a foundation, and that is God is spirit. And we reflected on God's creation of the human spirit in us. We are a spiritual being with a body. Today we are going to look at the creation of the human body. It's the well-known passage that you are familiar with from Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, we don't have time today to do justice to this profound passage, and we will devote more time on this in a few weeks. But for now, I want us to notice two things in this verse. First, we humans are not an accident of evolution. God created us in his own image. God created new creatures who were not there before. 
there is a radical discontinuity in God's act of creation. Second, God created male and female. Being male or female is not an accident of randomness. God designed us to be either male or female. Our body is uniquely designed and created by God. But in our society, the only paradigm that is accepted in public discourse is Darwinian evolution. Dr. John Sanford, who used to be a professor of applied genetics at Cornell University, began to do something that was unthinkable as a Cornell professor. He began to question Darwinian evolution. And he did so with fear and trepidation. The fear that he would be ridiculed and mocked. But to his great amaz amazement, he discovered that the theory of evolution was built on a house of cards. Ironically, it was science itself that was exposing the fragile foundation of Darwinian evolution. Now there is reason the theory of evolution looks attractive. When we compare animals, we notice that there are obvious similarities. And we look at these similarities and assume that the creatures evolved gradually from simple ones to more complex ones. But those similarities are superficial. It is only within the past 20 years that we have the technology to examine what actually happens in evolution. Now this is a very important concept. Evolution happens at the molecular level. We need to abandon the old idea of evolution which was based on superficial similarities and examine what actually happens at the molecular level. Today there are more and more evidence demonstrating that Darwinian evolution is not an upward progress, but a downward decay. And I will try to unpack it, first based on the latest science, and also show that it is consistent with the Bible, the Word of God. Now, I'm not an expert in science, so I'm speaking as an amateur. So I will post some of the references on our website so that you can explore the topic more deeply. It is impossible for our mind to fathom how complex and sophisticated the cell is. Even though the cell is the simplest living organism, it's a miniature factory that is more complex than anything we humans ever built. And we have 30 trillion cells like this in our body. Now within the cell is the DNA. The human DNA is a string of 3 billion characters. And the information in the DNA is passed on to the next generation, to our children. Now most of the time, the DNA string is stored inside the nucleus of the cell. Now, if you were to pull out the DNA from one of the cells, it would be about two meters long, or about six and a half feet long. But it is too thin to be visible to naked eye. Now, what if you magnify it so that its thickness would be that of the human hair. How long do you think it would be? It would be 40 miles long from Newark to Trenton. 
Imagine a string as thin as the human hair that stretches out 40 miles all the way to Trenton. Now, suppose your job is to pack this 40 mile long string into a basketball size without getting it tangled. Now, if you say that's humanly impossible, you're right. But your job is even more difficult than that. You must pack it in such a way that you can read information from any segment along the 40 mile long string whenever you want it. Your DNA is doing that right now. It is arranged into what looks like a ball inside the nucleus. And it is an extremely complicated structure and it's constantly moving inside the nucleus. The segments that do not read to be read, do not need to be read, are moved to the inner space and those that need to be read are moved outward so that the information can be read by another molecular machine. How in the world does it do that? How does it know what to do? It's absolutely mind-boggling. It's impossible to dismiss it by saying all this happened by chance. It demands an explanation. The cell is crying out for an explanation. This is clear evidence for God's handiwork when we engage in science with an open mind. We see the evidence for God's handiwork everywhere. God has lavished on us a world <clears throat> full of beauty and wonder. We just need to open our mind to perceive it. We need to learn, we need to, learn to see all this with a sense of awe and wonder. Even the tiniest living creature, the trillions of cells in our body, declare the glory of God. Now many people still assume that the cell gradually evolved from, evolved from a single cell organism into more complex organisms. So the question is, is there any evidence that the cell is becoming more and more complex? Is Darwinian evolution an upward progress? Perhaps the greatest experiment on evolution was done by Dr. Lenski, a microbiologist. He started an ingenious experiment of growing the E. coli bacteria. The E. coli reproduces itself six or seven times a day. So in 24 hours, it goes through six to seven generations. Each morning, Dr. Lenski and his team would take a small portion of the bacteria and put them into fresh flasks. They started this back in 1988. As of now, the bacteria have gone through more than 70,000 generations. So what have they found? Early on, only after a few thousand generations, they found that, that the bacteria were going, growing 40% faster than the original. And after 70,000 generations, some of them are growing 70% faster than the original. Now that sounds incredible. It looks like the bacteria are progressing upward. It looks like Darwinian evolution is doing wonders. But what is really happening here? Again, evolution happens at the molecular level. So we need to examine how mutation changes 
the bacteria's DNA. It turns out that the bacteria are growing faster, not by creating more information or better functions, but by degrading or turning off functions that they already have in the DNA. Now, this is counterintuitive. How can degrading or turning off functions make them grow faster? It's because when they turn off or throw away functions that are not essential in the environment they are in, they end up saving energy. Dr. Michael Behe, in the book Darwin Devolves, likens it to the loss of function in a car. Suppose you are driving through a dry, hot desert, and you are running out of gas, and you need to get to the nearest gas station that's 100 miles away. What would be your survival strategy? You need to improve the gas mileage of your car by throwing away extra weight as much as possible. You throw away the rear seat, the passenger seat, spare tire. You might need those things later, but you need to survive at the moment. So you throw away things for a short-term benefit. Likewise, the bacteria are throwing away functions for a short-term benefit. They are losing functions. They are being degraded. They are getting sick. So while they are reproducing faster, they are also dying faster. They are mutating left and right. And some of the bacteria are eating their own dead. Dr. Michael Behe writes, the resulting E. coli is one sick puppy. That's how random mutation and natural selection works. It's random. It has no foresight. It does not create new information. It selects whatever gives a short-term benefit by degrading or turning off functions. Evolution is not an upward progress. It is a downward decay. Now what about us, humans? With a bacteria, one generation is just a few hours, but with humans, one generation is 25 to 30 years. So such a laboratory study cannot be done. But there is one case that has been studied very extensively, and that is our body's response to malaria. And Dr. Michael Behe talks about it uh, in detail in his books. Malaria, as you know, is a deadly disease. In some regions of the world, Malaria kills half the children before they reach the age of five. It's a horrible disease. The malaria parasite enters the bloodstream and quickly reproduces 20 copies of itself. And each one of those 20 copies produce 20 copies of itself. And within a few days, a trillion malaria parasites can overwhelm the body. Now, there is one mutation in humans that arose in response to malaria and helps the chance of survival. It is a single point mutation, that is, a change of just one character out of the three billion characters in the human DNA. And those who have this single mutation has a survival advantage in regions where malaria is prevalent. But that's not the whole story. The same mutation that gave advantage against malaria causes 
sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease is also deadly because it breaks red blood cells. So in areas where malaria is prevalent, it is somewhat advantageous to have a sickle cell mutation. But in areas where malaria is absent, sickle cell disease takes over. Dr. Michael Behe describes this as a trench war standoff, natural selection balanced heartbreak against heartbreak, as an equilibrium was negotiated between the plague of malaria and the curse of sickle cell disease. This captures the limitation of Darwinian evolution. It works by breaking functions, in this case, red blood cells, for short-term benefits. Darwinian evolution is not an upward progress, but a downward decay. We humans are on a downward decay. We have about 100 mutations per generation. That is 100 mutations from parents to children. Now, only a small number of mutations are deadly. Most of the mutations are only slightly detrimental, and they appear to have no immediate effect. But they accumulate over generations. And we humans are degrading slowly from generation to generation. According to one prominent, prominent geneticist, our fitness is declining one to three percent per generation. This is a sobering reality, and it should compel us to pause and reflect on what our hope is. As our body is wasting away, what is our hope for the future? On what do we place our hope? Now, I've spent a lot of time today getting to this point, just to say that all of this is consistent with the Bible. The Word of God is trustworthy. The book of Genesis is not a mythology. It is telling us the truth about the human being. According to Genesis, God created the human beings, Adam and Eve, male and female, exactly as he intended humans to be, perfect, without any mutation, as the highest of all creatures. And God designed human beings to live forever with access to the tree of life. We know that from Genesis 3.22, where God says, He, that is Adam, must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Then after expelling Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, God placed the cherubim and a flaming sword at the east entrance of the garden, so as to guard the way to the tree of life. So because of their rebellion against God, Adam and Eve lost their access to the tree of life, and they could not live forever. But they still lived for a very long time. The immediate generations following Adam and Eve lived for over 900 years. Now this raises questions in our mind because living 900 years is quite remote from our experience. 
There are symbolic meanings to these long ears based on the numbers five and seven, but I also believe that these long ears are based on historical reality. After Adam and Eve, the fallen human beings multiplied and increased in number, but their wickedness was spiraling out of control. And God intervened at the time of Noah, saying in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, his days will be a hundred and twenty years. So at the time of Noah, God limited the lifespan of humans. We don't know how he did it, but we do see a striking pattern in the genealogy after Noah. Now we need to understand that biblical genealogies are intended not for chronological completeness, but for theological significance. Most likely they are not chronologically complete, but I believe that they are firmly based on historical reality. What is plotted here is average life expectancy versus the number of generations from Noah. The blue dots are the number of years people lived, from Noah to Shem, to Abraham, to David, to the Roman period around the time of Jesus, where the life expectancy was assumed to be approximately 45 years. And the red line is the curve that Dr. Sanford fitted to the biblical data. You will probably recognize the shape of this curve as exponential decay. And exponential decay is precisely what you would expect from genetic degradation. Since the time when God limited our days to 120, our lifespan has been decaying exponentially. Even now we are accumulating 100 more mutations each generation. Evolution is a downward decay. We know that for the past century, life expectancy has been rising because of the advances in medical technology, vaccines, and cleaner environment. But that seems to be plateauing in America. And there seems to be increasing illnesses due to genetic disorders. And that is a concern. Again, we are faced with a sobering reality. But that's not the end of the story. God has provided a way for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ to live forever in his everlasting kingdom. In the book of Revelation chapter 22, in the middle of the heavenly city is the tree of life. And the Lord Jesus says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Those who wash their robes, that is, those whose sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, are given the right to the tree of life tree of life, the right that was taken away from Adam and Eve, but right given to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, that they may live with him forever. The word of God is trustworthy. What the Bible says about human beings is true. We are not a product of randomness. We are designed ever so precisely by God. God created us male and female exactly as he intended us to be. And he created us to live forever. 
with access to the tree of life. If you repent and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be given the right to the tree of life. And there will be no more deaths, no more sorrow, no more pain. And Christ will make all things new. And you will live with him forever and ever. You will dwell in the light of his glory. You will drink from the water of life. And you will feast with Christ together with all the redeemed of the Lord. So trust the word of God. Put your hope in Christ and him alone. And stand on Christ the solid rock. Amen.